and I think we're recording. We are. Keith Walsh, uh, DJ, artist, just completely creative mind. Thanks for doing the day in the life with us here in the Kilkenny people. Uh, you've got Kilkenny Connection. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Tell us about your... Yeah, thing. my mum and dad are... My mum and dad are born born, bred and buttered in Kilkenny. They, they now live in, in Kildare, but uh, my dad grew up in the Butts and uh, my mother is Teresa's Terrace. So they're kind of the same area, just two opposite, just opposite sides of the water barracks. Um, so yeah, but I, I have, uh, they, they left there a long time ago, um, but they, I mean, my mother's Beg Begley, originally from Kerry, uh, and Waterford, and my dad is Kilkenny County, I think, down through the, the centuries. Uh, he's a Walsh, so uh, it's, I mean, obviously it's a big name in Kilkenny, but I have a lot of cousins and aunties and uncles, both Begley's and Walsh's, and probably O'Neill's in, in Kilkenny and, and, and in the county. Okay, and did you spend summers down here? Do you remember a childhood down in Kilkenny, down by the river? Oh yeah, God. Yeah, I would have spent a lot of time uh, with, I have an Auntie Kitty there, uh, I have an uncle, John, my gra both my grannies obviously were there. So I would have been, I would have stayed in my granny in the butts, I would have stayed in my granny in Teresa's Terrace, I would have played in the CBS field behind Teresa's Terrace, I would have uh, um, hung out at the water barracks, there's a football pitch down, there's basketball courts, the handball alleys, all that kind of mm -hmm. place, and just hanging around, generally hanging around Kilkenny City as well, I love it, I, I really... I mean the castle, of course. Um, I remember, I remember being down there one summer with uh, my older cousin Richard, and we were in the castle. Uh, but we were in there. Obviously, it was too late. We got locked in, and uh, we <laughs> had to. to all of we us had, by accident. We had we had to escape. Out of the, out of the, but but the wall was quite high on the other side. Do you know the wall by the river? Yeah. Uh, that that's the way we got out. So it was quite a drop. Uh, so I just remember that being, that being quite a dramatic escape from the castle. Uh, hanging over the wall and then and sort of <laughs> dropping down, trying not to break her legs. That's some so. drop. I'm surprised you didn't break two ankles when you landed there. That's some drop. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I think I remember my 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 uh, cousin Richard was a bit older, so he went first, and then he kind of I sort of dropped down onto his shoulders or something. But uh, so he he probably saved my legs. But yeah, it was very dramatic. We, were, we thought we were going to be <laughs> we thought we were there for for the night. Well, when you're allowed at Kildare, we'll give you the royal tour to Kenny Castle and we'll let you out the front gate <laughs> the next time. Um, my, uh, my, my, uh, my dad's grandfather used to work uh, as a footman with, uh, when, the, when, there was a fa when the family lived in, in I presume there were butlers, were they, when they yeah, lived in yeah. the castle. Mm -hmm. He worked with the horse, he worked with the horses, uh, so we do, I basically have a claim to the castle if it's up for grabs. <laughs> Um, every butler in Ireland does. I'm a butler too. <laughs> I'll fight you for it. Oh, okay. Uh, Keith, um, I've uh, been listening to you on 2FM for years. You're 20 years in, in the music industry and DJing. Um, do you miss radio? You, you finished up in the last 12 months with um, RTE. Do you miss it? Because you've had a bit of a change, a career change. We'll talk about your new job now in a minute. Um, but do you miss it? Um, I can't say I miss it. Uh, the only thing I ever miss, because I've worked in radio for 20 years and I always miss the people I'm working with, not but not the place, you know. Um, I We did the breakfast show on 2FM, myself and Bernard and Jen for five years and we, we kind of had a good five years, you know. Uh, and we, uh, you know, we, we got the listenership up and we, we, we enjoyed it. It was it's it's high pressure though. I mean, it's with my new job. I was just kind of r realizing, like I used to think, I've always kind of worked in breakfast radio. So I was always sort of I, I never worked nine to five. It was almost more like five to nine. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely five to lunchtime. And I always thought that was a better way of working because you know you'd get home and you'd be here for the kids when they got home, do the homework and all that kind of stuff. But like I've realized now that actually I was probably absolutely wrecked all the time and. I noticed towards the end of the, the, the two FM five years, like my little half hour naps and during the day were <laughs> like two, two hour, three hour naps. So I just wasn't, it's, it's, uh, Dermot Whelan is a guy who presents on Today FM with uh, Dermot and Dave. And uh, I interviewed him recently for the podcast and he said, you are, uh, 
constantly wrecked from having to get up at five o'clock in the morning. But also he says, but you're also operating on adrenaline then because you're presenting the show. So he said, that's a, that's a crazy mix, you know, uh, and, and yeah, I, I, and, I and really to, get and, that now. So I'd, Yeah, to, and to come down from that, because it's either fight or flight and you're on that mm. all the time, aren't you? And and, and that's where I met you is um, on Siobhan Murray's burnout course, um, all about resilience and trying to get the balance right. Is there such a thing? Um, uh, and did you go to, did you come across Siobhan Murray because of, is she, I, for anybody who doesn't know her, she's a burnout expert, because you were suffering from burnout from being from those early mornings or why did you start attending Siobhan's yeah. course? Uh, yeah, Siobhan was another person I had on the podcast and uh, I was just interested in, and we got chatting and then I realised she's also a coach, you know, so she'll she'll help people who, uh, I had a few ideas I wanted to get off the ground and she assisted me with that and I just did the burnout course as sort of a, uh, out of curiosity and interest uh, and to learn a little bit about, you know, to, I suppose I wasn't, when I did the course, I wasn't suffering from burnout because I'd, I'd gone through my sort of my therapy journey and it, you know I'd started like what I I, I I meditate now and I'm, I'm very aware of mindfulness and, and all that kind of stuff and um but I but I suppose it's just I was interested in the watch the watch outs and, and the signs of burnout as well and how to cope uh, and also I was interested in how she presented her course and how that works as well from a business sense mm -hmm. so a few different reasons she's just an interesting woman you know She's extremely interesting. And and did she, I, I know I've interviewed her before as well, and she's 13 years um, on dry November. <laughs> still, yeah. still going at it. Yeah. She um, forgot, she forgot 13, to stop. 13 years later, she's still pouring the Diet Coke into the wine glass every evening. Um, you also took a leaf out of her book, or was that beforehand as well? I, I, I've been watching you during the pandemic and you haven't, you've given up alcohol and you've just made an announcement only a few weeks ago that you're going to give it up for good. Why is that? Yeah, so I gave it, I gave it up to war. I was working a, a good bit. Of, uh, I'm trying to think of what year it is even. Uh, ending the 2019, I suppose. Uh, I was working a good bit in RT. I was doing stuff on Radio 1. I was doing cover. I was doing stuff on 2FM. I was quite busy. I had plans to write a play uh, in the coming year. And I knew that I had kind of really had to kind of have my wits about me, have a clear head for the year ahead. So I decided to take on a challenge and I gave myself, uh, I invented the 100 days of no booze challenge. Uh, which I which I started uh, after Christmas, so around New Year's Eve, just before New Year's Eve, and I said, "Look, I'm going to go for the next three or four months uh, booze free," and I just needed a break. Um, and yeah, I just kept going. I didn't really want to go back drinking, so it's a year and five months. And yeah, I, I kind of made an announcement. I do these things to myself uh, because I, I feel like once you say something and I, I really wanted to say it like like I really want to keep not to stay uh, booze free that's kind of my main goal at the moment but I worry all the time that I won't be able to um, and it's not that I'm and that this is the this is the issue it's not that I have my drinking was so bad that if I go back I could die it's not that extreme but uh, I just don't want to drink again and and it's when you're that kind of like, I only really ever drank, you know, weekends, holidays, you know, weddings. I wasn't like a, a middle of the week because I couldn't have done my job. For yeah, getting up at 5am, you couldn't have, yeah. And I wasn't able, I wasn't, I, I and, and I suppose it, it's probably, I wasn't, inter I wouldn't be a glass of wine person or a beer or a couple of beers. Um, so it was kind of, I, was a bit, I suppose I was a bit all or nothing really when I look at it. But uh, yeah, I just... I kind of made announcements on social media sort of to tie myself to something um, because I wasn't sure, like, I was thinking, do you go to, if you if you just want to stay off the booze, is there, you know, is there a group like A that you go to every week to kind of keep you focused on it, you know, to give you reasons to, but I have plenty of reasons to stay off it. I'm currently drinking my fizzy, my can of club, club soda, 
Um, you can drink the fizzy stuff now, get the calories and that instead of the beer. But I, I, I tried mm. it again. Siobhan influenced me. That's when I heard her the first time on radio talking about her, her dry November. So I did dry November. I did dry January. I haven't done the last couple of dry months. But the brain fog that it lifts, like the energy you have at weekends, it's it's great, isn't it? Like I recommend it to anyone. I'd love to be as brave as you, though, and just knock the head on it. Um, like what's your motivation yeah it's like uh, I I just like life is much better without it that's ultimately it mm -hmm. uh, full stop like uh, and the thing for me was I could always like people talk about oh I gave up drink because I couldn't handle the like this is not I, I like I don't want to get into the like there's people who have a problem and that's a whole other issue you know and, and that's a terrible place to be and, and, I, and I probably did have a problem in that like I, I I self-medicated so I was obviously going through whatever I was going through and then I'd get to the weekend and the only way for me to relax or get outside my own head or you know quiet the noise in my head was to drink and you know it was, it was you know through going to therapy that that all stopped so I didn't really need it anymore so it was you know it's more than just saying I'm not drinking anymore it was like a feeling that I have all the time now that I don't that I know that the feeling I get from drinking isn't going to make any better so that's that's how I feel. Um, and I was okay when I drank with, with, I was okay with hangovers. So I could drink and then get up the next morning and do whatever I had to do. You know, I go about my business. It never really affected me. What did, what I did notice was, and what I, what is gone now was the anxiety and the fear. Like people joke about the fear, but I would have had a, a real fear for most of the week. If I, ha if I drank on Friday night and Saturday night, for the rest of the week, I'd have this kind of, which I didn't realize at the time, but I'd just be, I'd have a fear that something terrible was going to happen. Like this is impending sense of doom. That something bad was going to happen. I was a bad person. Everything was bad. You know, it just, I just, it was, it was a darkness. I'd describe it as, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. and I was doing guilt. a lot of, I, yeah, it was guilt. It was, but I was doing a lot of work on my mental health as well. And I thought, well, I'm not gonna, how am I gonna progress? How am I going to progress as a person? How am I going to make my, you know, if I'm working so much in mental health, I, I really don't need the fuel of booze to be thrown on that fire, you know? So, uh, and I don't miss the anxiety. I don't miss the fear. I don't miss the, my life. I feel free. Like, even if you don't really drink that much, you think about it a lot. I mean, I don't think people realize you're either thinking about not drinking or you're thinking about when you're going to drink. So, yeah. Mondays, yeah. you're, Mondays you're tired and you're thinking I shouldn't have drank so much over the weekend and I'm not going to drink as much next next weekend and then Tuesday you're thinking you know maybe someone's having a beer or something and you're like no I can't I don't drink Tuesday I've got to work the next day Wednesday you're thinking about you know tomorrow you might it's just all you're, you're always calculating when you can drink and when you can't drink how much you can drink how much you can't drink and you drive and when you just when you give it up the freedom it's like it's a whole you have a whole other bath full of energy and and uh, other things become much more important and and all that time you're spending just thinking about booze or not not thinking about booze weird i know but you'd encourage anyone i might give it a go again um <laughs> and you're, you're you're an open book you've mentioned a few times there about therapy and i read in an interview once before you, you said that you wish you'd done therapy before you had your kids that was your only regret that you why was that you have two children, isn't well, it? I mean, I, yeah, so Anna is, God, Anna's uh, leaving her year this year, and Finn is uh, 12, coming on 13 in sixth class. And yeah, I just wish it was, it, it, somebody asked me about any regrets about parenting, and that was one I said, I wish I'd uh, gone to therapy before I'd had my kids, or before I got married, or, you know, I feel like, I feel like even now, since I started going to therapy, um, and, and the reason I talk about it a lot is because it, it shouldn't be a big deal. It's, you know, if you feel like going to therapy, go to therapy. It's great. I highly recommend it. You don't have to hit rock bottom. You don't have to have any, just go and, you know, talk to, talk to somebody and, you know, get stuff off your chest. It's really good. But yeah, I, I wish I'd, and, and, and I wish I'd had, I mean, I've learned an awful lot in, 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 in my life and I've experienced a lot, but I think, if I'd 
gone to therapy, uh, you know, in my late teens, it would have helped me a lot more to to know myself and to like myself and love myself and appreciate myself and allow myself to do the things I wanted to do. Um, and I'm only sort of getting to that point now in my life, which is which is in one way it, it could you know it's it's a bit of a shame, but in other ways it's it's great that I'm getting to do it at all because some people don't ever get to that point. So if you're um, look, looking in the mirror at 16 year old Keith, what would you be telling him to do differently? Well, totally. I'd just be saying, look, go to therapy, and you you need it and you deserve it. You know, we we grew up in a, in a strange time uh, in the eighties. I'm a bit older than you, Sean, and uh, not much. <laughs> it was a, it, it was a, it was a it was a tough time for children you know um you know i definitely feel the children were three to second class citizens uh in the home and in school and yeah the, you know corporate punishment and and domestic violence was was run of the mill and that's not to point point the finger or, or blame anybody mm. it's just a fact of the way things were and that's how society worked but you still have to you know i still had to recover from that and do whatever i had to do to to uh, ensure that that kind of stuff, that whatever damage that had done to me wasn't dragging me down. Um, and it, you know, it took me till my mid forties to do that, to readdress it. So, yeah. so yeah, I wish I'd done it years ago, you know? Because when you're in the, that situation, when, when something triggers you or an emotion, and I know this from therapy myself, it's the, it's the, the four year old or the nine year old or whatever, that, that's the child that responses, not the adult you. Um, so it's it's just to really yeah. kind of, to to ma to 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 love that child and say it's okay. Um, you know, own it and feel it. And I think that's something you'll only learn through therapy, isn't it? To go back through the layers through the years. Yeah, totally. And even to see, uh, even to see the way you think about things as an adult and how your head works um and th that doesn't have to be that's not necessarily right and it doesn't have to be the case like you don't have to doubt yourself so much or you don't have to be so suspicious of people or you don't have to be a people pleaser or you don't have to be you know so passive in life you can actually you know decide and write down what the things you want to do and the things you want to achieve and go for it and you know the, all those things i had to separate from I had to really think about my thinking and how my head had been working and how to change that. And that was mine. To, to, that was my work to do uh, and my work to own. And I'm still doing it. You know, I, I still check in. Luke, Luke is an end, my therapist. I still check in with him. Uh, and especially like I've started a new job in the last little while. I'll check in with him and go, look, these are my fears. These are my worries. What do you think? He'll get me, you know, obviously I, Ultimately, with therapy, you figure it out yourself, but um, it's just great to have that facility and tool there to tap into when you're, you know, when you're like me starting a new job was like, it was my first time. I felt like this is my first time doing a job as the, as the, as Keith 2.0, the new Keith, you know, and I wanted <laughs> to approach it pro properly with an open mind and I didn't want to fall back on old habits. And I also didn't want, I wanted to make sure that I didn't end up like, you know, working nine to five, drinking at the weekends, going back into some sort of, you know, uh, old, you know, old way of working. I, I, I like my new way of working. I want to keep, keep going, you know, I want to keep doing that. So you, what do you say? therapy you will always be with me. In it. You, you feel like you're growing up now with this new job. You already said it's time to grow up yeah, and like get a real like... job. And like, what, what is the job? You're creative director, is it? Yeah, so it's creative director, audio, copywriting, uh, and script writing. So basically, uh, Think House are a um, full service agency. They look after advertising, marketing, PR, and I, you know they've taken me on as a creative. So it'll be my job to write scripts for ads and copy for you know TV ads, radio ads, billboards, whatever. You know, be come up with clever stuff be creative, uh, come up with good ideas. And I suppose they're, they're paying me to be creative and to be clever and to be funny or whatever, be serious, whatever's needed. And uh, I, you know, I kind of feel like they were good enough to give me the job and I, it's, it's a, 
I've, I'm unproven in this field, so I have to prove myself, you know? And they're taking a chance on me because they could have gone to another uh, marketing agency and taken a guy who's already done this job and has proved himself and won awards on it. You know, it's that kind of uh, level of job. So, you know, I'm very determined to go in there. And, and yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of like, I suppose I was joking and then I got a real job, but th- th- like this is, isn't, this is my ideal job. Mm-hmm. This is. Well, you, you seem know, to take right all the boxes. For me everything you said there that's part of your your task you, you take all the boxes you've kept a lot of us entertained during the lockdown with your creativity um like you're, you're taking on the tiktoks at your daughter you'd give gordon ramsay and his daughter a run for their money but but there's a lot you've done keith for people during lockdown so i can see why they came to you not not the guy with the the marketing masters you're the guy who thinks outside the box and um i've seen you in action uh, you, 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 the creativity which you're carding with Keith. Uh, can we talk about that? Um, stuff you've done for kids and adults during lockdown. Like, where did that come out of? My own daughter took your course, your Zoom class, and she laughed mm. for an hour and a half solid. I know you went way over time, and she thought she was only online for 20 minutes. Um, so, like, oh, brilliant. You inspire people. So, I know you like. You, get that imposter syndrome out of the way this is the reason why you know you're hired but like where did all this idea of the cardio with Keith that's so unusual I was going isn't that the DJ and now he's an artist like where where is all this coming from yeah yeah it, it literally was a kind of a like I took a leap of faith by leaving RT because then I had no job and I started uh, I, I, one evening I made a card for my wife and uh, like the thing about therapy is it gets you doing things that you enjoy. And I used to do, I used to, I used to, I loved art. Like I did very well in my leaving cert with art. I studied graphic design for a year in college. Um, and I, you know, it's something I hadn't done for a long time. So stuff, that kind of thing I started dabbling in, experimenting in. I made a card for my wife. It was just a little picture of a house. And I wrote, sorry, I left the house in shite. Um, <laughs> and left, left that for her. And, uh, you know, put it up on social media. People got a good laugh out of it. So people started asking me for cards. I started drawing cards. I started selling them. And I kind of, you know, this was like my side hustle uh, to kind of, I said, I said to my wife, I'm going to, I'm going to make cards. I'm going to sell them. And it's going to be enough money to pay uh, for something, you know, like, you know, I, so we were able to like take that off the, the list of bills and that'll be that. And then I can do other stuff because like, I had the play going on. And she was kind of thinking, I think you need to go down to Tesco's and get a job there, Keith. You know? <laughs> so I was like, well, well, look, if I do this and I do this and I do this and I did a few different kind of side hustles, as I call them, going. And that was kind of contributing to the to the to the pot for the bills. Um, so so the cards kind of got me, uh, allowed me to just do my own thing, allowed me to f- do the play, allowed me to uh, do whatever I need to, to, to not. There was no pressure on me to get a, a job, you know, um, but I love doing them as well. And I, so I did a lot of Christmas cards. I did uh, all sorts of Mother's Day cards. Uh, and and I also uh, made a calendar for this year as well, which I which uh, I just hand drew a full calendar, you know. Um, and I don't know, it was just something I just started doing. I just got into a space and I really enjoyed it, and it clicked with me then because I was doing a lot of work with for myself on meditation and mindfulness and talking to Luke, my therapist. And I I went went to Luke one day and I said, I've got this idea, and I think this would be really a really good workshop. So the idea was that, you know, we'd sit down with kids and we could do some with kids and do some with adults, different, different workshops. And we just draw, we just make cards. We just, uh, you know, I send out a pack, you get your colors, you get your pens, you get your cards, you get your envelopes. And then you sit down at a Zoom, especially for COVID, this was kind of handy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you sit down at the Zoom and we just draw and then we create three cards. And at the end of the class, you've done a bit of drawing, I speak about mindfulness, especially with kids, because kids hear the word mindfulness a lot, but they, it doesn't really, I, I think it doesn't, they don't really get what they're talking about. But if you say to a child as they're drawing and they're completely lost in, you know, creating something and you just say, you know, that if you've ever heard the word mindfulness, this is mindfulness, you know, oh, and it just, okay. yeah. so, so it gives them an, an actual idea of, of what it is. Um, and at the end, then they, they, they have three cards that they've drawn on the covers and then they write a little message in the three of them. And the first one is about being grateful. Uh, 
So something you're grateful for, somebody you love, write a little note for them and say thank you. You know, it could be, you know, it could have been for you, Siobhan. You might have got a card said thank you. No, for my childminder did. Um, He's like a third granny, so I didn't get it. <laughs> You which we've got them to do too and then yeah. uh so then and then the other the other one's a card a card about forgiveness so you can forgive yourself for getting angry with someone or you can forgive somebody that you got angry with or you know if you're annoyed mm -hmm. about something you can that's about forgiveness and the third one then was about self-love so you write a card to yourself and and i was trying to get the kids to write down three things they liked about themselves because you know the things that we the things that keep us that keep me anchored and mindful and in the present and uh, aware are being grateful for the things I need to be grateful for uh, forgiving the people that I need to forgive and then appreciating myself and those three things so so that was kind of the whole idea and I did a few workshops and uh, yeah it seemed to go well you know yeah uh, yeah and, and that's something that anyone that's struggling with this pandemic is to do something like that, to play an instrument, to take up drawing, to sing, to, to just to do something creative, isn't it? Isn't it? Like there's going to be such an onslaught of mental illnesses and struggles after this. And we can't put the rose colored glasses on and, and think it's not going to happen. It is going to happen. Um, do you have any advice for the Irish government or what would are the people, what, what we should do or how we should get through it? Because it is going to be not so pretty at the other end. Yeah, I think we really need to look at um, how we used to live our lives. Um, and this is like, we look, we have to look at the, at the school system. Uh, this is this is something I could talk a lot about. We have to look at the, at, at our, the way we work. And I think the way we work is changing. I mean, I, I know that a lot of workplaces and businesses can see a financial benefit of a blended work week where you sometimes work from home sometimes go into the office you know that you're not stuck commuting for two hours every day that you're not stressed out that you're getting to see your family that you're not like so wrecked at the weekend that all you can do is have a few beers and watch the match and you're not actually living life you're just getting recovering from the week every weekend so 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 we need to really let people off the hook and give them a bit of space and i think that like the schools have been absolutely brilliant during lockdown. They've really been, uh, they've really reacted. But at the same time, I've noticed that they're still really driven. Uh, so like, you know, even if you've got, you've got your junior search, your leaving search, your, you know, for the sixth class kids, you might have your drum conjure tests or whatever it is. They're still really driving the kids. Um, and which is very admirable that they're still getting that work done and that's their job. But I think somebody in the Department of Education needs to say, listen, can we just forget all that at the moment? Can we literally just spend a year or six months or whatever, just chilling the F out and just teaching the kids about, like just go on nature walks or talk to each other, or, you know, um, just give them time to recover. It can't just be like straight out of, straight out of COVID, you know, in, you know, schools talking about, you know, after Christmas, some of the school, kids went back to school and straight away there's schools talk about mock exams and leaving cert and I'm like can we just get rid of the leaving cert for a year it doesn't actually matter like the most important thing here is that we make sure that everybody is well and everybody stays alive and that nobody feels so much pressure that they decide that they can't you know it, 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 we just need to really look after each other and, and you need the government to tell the schools because the schools they're just doing their job. The teachers, they're just doing their jobs. Nobody's telling them, look, take, ease off the pedal there. It's okay. Let's just chill out for a little while. Let's not worry too much about the leaving cert results this year. Let's not worry too much about the junior cert results this year. Let's just let the kids find their feet first for a little while. That's yeah. what I would say. I, I don't think anybody's really, I, I, th I think, I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of things are just going to go back to the way they were. You know? I know. And we and listen, it's happened. The first and second lockdown, we all promised we were going to, walk more go for those saturday morning coffees and life just went back to run around the place like lunatics again but i agree with you i think kids learn need to learn how to socialize again like mm, that's yeah. something they've like really the missed and how to be with one and just how to interact with one another not through a screen um we all have to learn that but um yeah anyway. like 
there will be an, there'll be enough anxiety of just returning to, to classes and seeing other people and being in a, a busy classroom and all that kind of stuff without then you know I get the determination like we're still gonna uh, we're still gonna get these exams and we're still gonna be you know and that all comes down to these league tables that are published every year the point system you know it's all this like we're we're, we're you know, the ladder, it's kind of like we get up to the top of the ladder and we realise it was up against the wrong wall, you know? We're... <laughs> Great way of saying it. <laughs> that, that sums up my life. <laughs> That's a brilliant way of saying it. Um, Keith, yeah, really... to, to, um, sorry I interrupted you. Um, to touch on your play that you spoke about, um, the play that you said you wrote, it's a one-man show, is it? And and we might see you in Kilkenny. Please God, everything open and up Yeah, well. hopefully. Yeah, like I, I, there was a tour uh, booked for last year, uh, just before Christmas, and it includes include include Kilkenny, um, which was great. Uh, the Watergate. Yeah. Um. Uh, the play is called Pure Mental, and it's a one man show, and it's I, it's a play I wrote with Janet Morn, who's a friend of mine. She's a a, a very accomplished actress, director, and writer, um, and I had written some stuff short stories uh i'd done some writing classes and uh i approached Janet. i said look i think i'd like to do something with this in a, in a i think there might be some sort of live thing in this and she said well i think it's a one-man play if you you know she helped me work it up um and she directed it and we performed half sort of a work in progress like half the play during lockdown uh with the Riverbank, the Riverbank Art Centre in Newbridge, who are who are brilliant. They've supported me. They're producing the play. They helped me um, apply for funding from the Arts Council, which we got, which is means we can get go, go to go on tour. Um, but yeah, we performed half it in the Riverbank. It went out online, about four thousand people watched it. Um, and then we, because of that, because of how well it went, we, we the Riverbank gave us a few more quid. We wrote the rest of the play. And we were all set to tour at the end of last year. And then the other lockdown happened. I mean, I suppose in the back of our minds, we weren't sure if it would happen at all, but we, we worked towards it anyway. Um, and that was all kind of like rehearsing over Zoom and, you know, occasionally meeting up in parks and all this kind of stuff. It was, it was crazy. And uh, so now we have a fully finished, you know, fully directed one man show ready to go on tour with thanks to the Riverbank and the Arts Council funding. And um, we're going to tour November, December, and we're hoping to have about 20 dates, including Kenny. So, um, yeah, and it, the play is about what happened when, like the breakfast show finishing up. I'm not going to say it was a surprise. We've done five years. These, you know, things change. You know, you've got to bring in fresh presenters. You know, if you're there for five years, that's not bad. We can't all be Ian Dempsey. And um, so, what, you know, there was a certain, I, I, I suppose there's a certain amount of disappointment in that. I was, it hit me kind of hard, you know, that that that, that was ending, and, and for for many reasons. And and once again, this is not like me pointing the, the finger of blame at anybody. This is just how I felt about it. Mm -hmm. I felt upset. I felt disappointed. I felt like you know these people didn't want me anymore. So the sense of rejection and all of everything I was feeling ultimately goes back to. The things that I didn't deal with as a child growing up that I learned about myself through therapy. So the play is that story. The, two, the breakfast show finishes up. What happens to Keith? And uh, and I tell the story and I talk about um, how I you know discovered therapy and how I wanted to make sure that you know the next job that came along or the next gig I needed to do that I was a better version of myself than I had been when the breakfast show finished up. So it's kind of like. What happens when you when you have a midlife crisis? And how do you get out the How do you get out the other side of it, a better person? You know. Well, we're all in the mid to late forties now, so those midlife crises are happening to all of us. Um, but you know what? I think being at a crossroads just makes you stronger, and uh, and you've shown it. Um, and the the play is a one man play, and you're you're the actor as well. I'm the man. Yeah, yeah. Like the thing about. The thing about a crisis, it can take you down. But I'm hoping that what I learned through the way I approach this crisis might help other people to get through it because it can. And especially for, it can be difficult for women, but men are bad at expressing ourselves. You know, we back ourselves into a corner that we can't get out of. 
um, we're, you know, we're expected to man up and be the strong, silent type. And, you know, but, but if you, if you're in your forties and you, you lose a job and you're worried about getting another job, that can be crippling for a man, you know, it can be crippling for anybody. Um, but ma- men are particularly bad at expressing themselves. And I wanted to take this up, take this, uh, crisis and turn it into an opportunity and it was one of the things I thought of early doors I was like this is there's something in this like this is bad I was like this is bad I'm like I'm struggling here and I'm, and I'm gonna have to go to therapy but there's definitely something in this there's a story in this for other people if I can tell it properly you know um Keith I know you're you're busy there and you need to get back to work but I just want to finish up by asking you for a nugget of advice for people coming out of this pandemic what should they hold on to? What should they do? What would you advise us? And you're wise now. God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't listen to me. That's my advice. <laughs> um, well, I would say find a good therapist and, you know, uh, and, and that would be my thing that worked for me. Um, but I, I suppose in general, maybe try and f- figure out, you know, the things that are important to you really sit down with yourself, really sit down with yourself because we, we have this, we feel like we're supposed to do, be everything to everybody else, but you can't be anything to anybody if you're not looking after yourself. So you need to sit down with yourself and this is the work that you owe yourself to do and the work that you need to do with yourself, sit down with yourself and write down what it is you want from life in the, in an ideal scenario and really put some effort into working towards that. And that doesn't mean, I think a lot of people think that, oh, I'd love to be, uh, I'd love to, I'd love to work with leather. I'd love to be a, I'd love to be a carpenter, but I can't because I'm an accountant or whatever. And they feel like I can't do that because I have to leave my job in the morning and then my husband or wife will be upset with me and the kids, will, there'll be no food. And, you know, it's almost like you can't change things without making without doing something drastic. It doesn't have to be like that. All you have to do is, you know, pick an evening where you're going to do something that you love and pick time for yourself and find find 10 minutes every day that you're going to just spend on yourself, even just 10 minutes. And those 10 minutes will will become will become a half an hour or whatever. But find time for yourself doing the things you love and and even, you know, say for instance, if you wanted to do a bit of writing, like sit down, which is sit down and say, these 10 minutes are for me and be very selfish about that. And the, and I always think of like, I always think of the thing, the, and, and as an analogy, uh, when you're on the plane, you always give, you know, you, you look after yourself, you give yourself the, put your own oxygen mask on before you, you look after anybody else. Because if you don't do that, you will be no good to anybody. Uh, yeah. So look after yourself. And then it's it, it, people think, oh, that's very selfish. If you look after yourself, you will be much better at looking after everybody else. That's it. And you're setting an example for the next generation. Put your life jacket on first before you can help others. Self-care, isn't that it? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it sounds, I mean, it sounds, I know people think it's hogwash, but it's, it's, it's real, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think when you get to our age, you'll get it. <laughs> but hopefully yeah. it's not, not too late. Keith, it's been an no. absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, best of luck with the new job. And um, Thanks, I'll be sure to be on the next card making course. And uh, the podcast, you were making three a week, probably a little less now. But um, where can people yeah, tune in just, and listen to your podcast? Yeah, they can get it wherever they get their podcast. And it's simply called the Keith Walsh Podcast. And uh, the one I, I I'll do one a week now with my friend Mike and we just chat about life and uh, it's it's just a bit of nonsense but we like it and, pe- and, pe- and we have some listeners so it's all good. Good. Well, when you're down in Kilkenny next, we'll give you the grand tour of Kilkenny Castle. And uh, we you, you can go out the front gate this time. <laughs> 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 Thanks so much and I appreciate your time. Take care. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.